everybody who registered and the whole wait list. Okay? <clears throat> Sound good? Mm -hmm. All right. If you don't mind, round of applause for Valerie for the uh, Parent Resource Center. Um, they do awesome work for the guys here filming, everybody doing this, and to you for coming out. You gave up a beautiful morning to come out. So uh, my assumption is most of you came because you have strong-willed kids or kids who aren't doing what you want them to do, right? How many of you have um, toddler age kids, if you don't mind? Good. Couple, I'll just do a couple quick things for each age group. Toddler age kids, uh, remember, are not supposed to be uh, efficient or productive. Their job is to basically ruin your agenda as a mother because their job is to make messes and to get into things. Chill with them. Don't, uh, remember, uh, we're gonna, you'll fall into the trap of, no, no, stop, stop. Don't put that in your mouth. Everything not to do. Remember to give them things to do. Focus that brain. Otherwise, you're going to be miserable with them. Uh, little kids, remember, music's really effective for getting them to move and to do things. Homework time for your older kids, by the way, music is extremely effective, and it doesn't have to be classical. Some of your kids need really intense music to listen to. It's just going to freak you out because you won't like their music, and you think they can't focus when they listen to music like that. But actually, the rhythm in the music and the intensity is extremely helpful, especially during the writing process. So remember, uh, try not to impose the way you learn on your child. Otherwise, you're going to have them sit still at a table while you stand over them and say, if you would just focus, you would be done in 45 minutes instead of it taking three hours. And for some reason, that's not effective. So um, younger kids, this is all younger kids. I've been throwing this out, uh, an obstacle course in the backyard or in the basement. This can cost 15 bucks, nothing, just stuff they have to crawl through, crawl under, over. I love waking kids up in the morning with, hey, guess where you're eating breakfast this morning? I hit it out in the obstacle course, and you have to go forage through it. How many of you have little kids who would love eating outside in the morning? Right? <laughs> little boys, the nastier you make it, the better. It's great for them because it's peaceful. It's good for you because your strong-willed child is out of the house. It's good for their siblings as well. Don't be afraid to do things a little differently, but I love kids in the morning after school even. First thing is treasure hunt in the backyard. Have them forage for something. Look, I like the physical pressure for many of your kids. It's very settling for them, and it's a great thing before school. Um, elementary school age kids, good. I'll spend a lot of time in, in that age group. Middle school, okay, good luck. It's a hard <laughs> age, right? It's a hard age. Realize middle school is a hibernation phase. There are very few middle school kids who are super motivated. They're not going to come home from school and say, Mom, listen, can you give me some extra chores and homework? I want to show you how motivated I am. They're not going to be like that. Normalize middle school. Let them know this is probably the hardest time of your entire life. It gets better after middle school. True? Because who has ever said, man, I wish I could go back and do middle school again? <laughs> Nobody. It's a horrible time of life. Let them know if you feel awkward, you should, and so do all your friends. You know why? Because you are. I'm kidding. Don't say that part. But normalize it so they don't feel like there's something wrong with them, right? How many of you have a middle school age boy in particular? Good. So tonight, if you came to the workshop, we're back here tonight at 6.30, if you were here, I would ask, hey, what do you think your son's doing at home right now? And the answer would be nothing, because they're probably not going to be doing their chores or their homework. They're going to be sitting in a hoodie sweatshirt, the same hoodie sweatshirt they've worn for about 18 straight days playing video games, because that's what they do. And you're going to get anxious about their future and think, who would possibly hire this child? Who is going to marry this child? And you're going to start lecturing that child. And watch how this happens, because I don't see you living up to your potential, and you're capable of so much more, because if you would just apply yourself, how many of you kind of go there? Do me a favor, stop that, because it'll cause your kids to get very angry and shut down, because they are trying. They just aren't always doing it the way you want, right? And, and what's going to happen in those years is, and even younger is, we tend to only focus on the negative. Why can't you ever do that? Why don't you do that? And kids start to shut down. And forgive me for, I uh, hope this doesn't offend anybody, but I'm going to be blunt today and just tell you what they're thinking. What they eventually think is, screw you. Mm -hmm. Screw you. It's never good enough for you. It's never good enough for teachers. Why would I even bother anymore? Because no matter what I do, it's never good enough. That's your own anxiety about their future because you don't see them living up to and you're projecting out. Please stop projecting out. Stop comparing your kids to their siblings unless you want them to murder each other. That's Cain and Abel. That's what happened, right? 
Don't compare to their peers. You're in Northern Virginia, and everybody here is awesome, and the kids are all going to Virginia Tech, and right, and all those schools. And some of your kids, you're not sure if they're going to jail, right, or what they're going to do, or working at Taco Bell. Relax, your kids, if you don't mind, I'm gonna roll with this. Relax, your kids are on a different timeline, and they're on a different timeline than you. And again, that's going to be your issue because these things are all artificial. Well, by this age, they should be able to do that. Who said? Go to Europe and the kids don't even start reading till seven or eight. And their kids are brilliant, right? Go to Germany, they're like ruling the world over there. They don't, where are you from originally, if you don't mind? Asia, whereabouts? Very nice, what part? Okay, I was just there, we were just there this summer. It was awesome, I love, that area is awesome. So, uh, Zemun? Is that it? Yeah. Is he, this is a very cool little town. Awesome food over there. And it's all like, not all like toxic like ours. So, right? <laughs> it's true. You can feed all the organic stuff you want to your kids, but it's all coming from toxic soil. So it really doesn't matter. <laughs> Sorry, it's a bloody thing there. Anyway, so it's pretty true, isn't it? Anyway, but still do it because it's good for your kids. It makes you feel like you're being a good parent. So, um, don't worry about nutrition so much with your little kids, please. You know why? Most of us didn't start eating healthy till we were in our 30s or 40s. True, we grew up on Pop-Tarts and, and sugar corn pops and cereal, and we turned out okay, right? But I do, I'm really into nutrition, but it's not everything. So, um, where was I? You gotta keep me on track. Kids are going to be worried about this. Timeline, timeline. All these timelines that we do with these kids, it's artificial, and some of your kids are late bloomers. And it's gonna frustrate you, because you're like, okay, I'm waiting for you to bloom, right? I'm not even seeing any little petals on your flower. You've gotta relax, because the more that you push these kids, the more they resist, true? How many of you have um, high school age kids? Oh, good, it's a lot. Usually people by high school, are like, screw it, I'm done, <laughs> right? So older kids, what we'll get to is um, internal motivation because it has to come from within. And then how many of you have at least one child that you term a little bit more strong-willed, right? And that's most of us. So I'm going to hit on the strong-willed kids and kids uh, who are uh, on the spectrum. And this is in general how we describe them. They're really bright kids. They're smart. They're not usually academically motivated by. What they're motivated by is arguing with you. And that's how they use their intelligence because they have very good critical thinking skills, which is an awesome thing in life. It just means they're a pain in the butt as kids because we don't really want kids who are good thinkers. I just want you to do what I told you to do, how I told you to do it. And the strong-willed kids are not like that. They're going to challenge you. These are kids who when you ask them to do something, their first question is, why? They're not being defiant usually. What they're looking for is context. They are very good strategic thinkers. And if you notice, very good at building with Legos, chess, checkers, arguing. It's the same part of the brain. We don't like that, but it's going to make them successful one day. And you've got to start to use that. And I'll try to do an example late, later with the relentless arguer, if any of you have the relentless arguer. Phenomenal trait. Irritating, but a phenomenal trait if you can use it to your advantage. Do you mind if I skip ahead and just do that? Let me do this really quickly. I need a guy. Uh, what's your name? You don't have to do anything. No, no, don't. You, right there. Striped shirt, dude. Not many. You don't have to do anything. Just need you as a reference point. So, Mike's my son. I come home from work. Mike comes home from school. And he's like, Dad, you have to take me to GameStop. I'm getting that new video game. And my response is always going to be, not going to happen. No. My no is always even. Matter of fact, it is very low key. I don't explain things to kids. Well, Mike, you know, I'd like to take you there, but your sister has soccer practice. That's an invitation for them to say, oh, sister can walk to soccer practice while you take me to GameStop, right? They're not looking, look, they're not looking to be convinced. Modern parents think, well, if I just explain it to them, right? One of your kids ever said, mom, I didn't realize what I was putting in my body was so unhealthy. But after you lectured me for the 40th time and showed me the food pyramid, which is all wrong anyway, all of a sudden I'm, they're not looking. So I'm gonna be like, Mike, not gonna happen. So what's going to happen? He's going to come after me, right? And I'm gonna walk away and he's gonna follow me. I'm gonna go up to my bedroom, double lock the door. He's going to go outside, climb up through the second floor window and come in. So here's, instead of, watch, we always react. Mike, why can't you ever take no for an answer? 
By the way, it's a perfect quality of a salesperson. And they make good money, <laughs> right? Watch this stuff because we end up saying things like, why can't you? So do I want them arguing? No, but let's, I've got one of two options. You know, if you keep that up, you're going to lose everything you want, blah, 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 blah. And it does that every time. So Mike, look, I've seen this scene, this movie unfold in our home like 34 times this month. Here's how this movie works. And here's the longer version. All day at school, here's what you were doing. You were thinking about that new video game because it's really cool and all your friends have it, but you don't because all your friends have parents who don't love them because they buy them whatever they want. <laughs> so you don't have it yet, but you're using your creative strategic brain because you already know my objections to taking to the video game store and you've already overcome them in your brain. You know why? You're a good strategic thinker. One day a company is going to pay you a lot of money because you're a good thinker but we're not going to GameStop. So the movie unfolds. You come home and I, you demand that I take you to GameStop. I don't do demanding. And I say no. Well, you don't take no for an answer. Another great quality. So you follow me. You come in through the second floor window. You know why? Because you're persistent. Because when you care about something and you want something, you have persistence. Number one quality necessary for success in life, according to a Harvard study, pig-headed determination, and your kids have it. They just don't have it at anything you want them to do. <laughs> and when things get tough, they don't push through. How many of your kids are like that? OK, be honest. How many of you are like that? Who pushes through? Right? We have to later in life, but most of it's human nature. So don't get freaked out by that. All of you do that. I don't think any of you push through at the gym this morning. You do the minimal necessary just to keep, like I do, right? I don't push through. So, so Mike, here's what I love about that. That persistence, awesome quality, but we're not going to GameStop. So here's how this movie ends, and you can skip right to this point. Mike, I know it's about to happen. I said no, you don't like no, so you're gonna follow me. You're gonna argue, and you're gonna end up talking and saying inappropriate things to me and calling me names and yelling at me. And what happens every time is, not only do you not go, get to go to GameStop, you're going to lose all of your other video games and you're going to end up in tears because that's how it happens every time. True? Watch, listen to the tone of voice. It's not this, why do you always have to, and I'm frustrated, I'm teaching him. Dude, I know it's about to happen. I've seen it before. Now you've got a couple options. We can do that if you want, but it hurts you every time you end up in tears. But here are two things I know about you. You love money. How many of your kids love money? And not in a bad way. They're just, look, they're born entrepreneurs. And you have a really big heart, never toward me, but toward other people. You ever, how, how many of your kids? Awesome for other people, awful for you. So listen, I've got to go get started on dinner. I'm going to go walk the dog. I like giving kids space. Space is important. I'd write that down. And I like movement. I'm not going to stand here. You know, we need to talk about your attitude, young man. Does that ever work? No. OK, what attitude? Right? And then it escalates. So now I'm teaching him, because discipline means literally to teach. It doesn't mean to punish or send to the room. It means to teach a child. So I'm teaching you. Look. We can use all of those awesome qualities. I've got to go get started on dinner. If you want to come help me, I bet we could use your creativity, your strategic thinking, your persistence, and come up with a couple ideas for you to run a little business in the neighborhood. You could earn your own money. With that own money, on Saturday morning, I'll take you to GameStop. You can buy your own video game with your own money, because I want you to have some ownership, and I'm not raising you to be an untitled little snot, right? And here's what else. If you do that, you'll learn how to problem solve. And that's a lifelong skill. Does that make sense? So, a couple things with that. Um, you know, I'm just gonna end that. I'm gonna come back, I'll come back a little bit later. But that process of teaching and showing, and I'm not getting frustrated, I'm just letting you know, you've got an option now. And when I walk away, I'm not saying, you know what, you have a choice to make right now, young man, and I'm gonna stand here while you make your choice. How many of you, when you're having a bad day, especially wives in here, want your husband saying, it's clear that you're upset. You know what, you need to change your attitude. 
and I'm just going to stand here. And you're like, uh, you're the reason for my bad attitude in the first place, hubby. So, right? I give him a little bit of space, and when I walk away, he can be like, this is dumb. This is stupid. I want my video game now. But he has time to process while I'm down in, downstairs fixing dinner, and then he'll come down, okay, what are your ideas? Your kids should be doing jobs in the neighborhood. Some of you have weird kids that like, like pulling weeds. Any of you have kids that like physical stuff, like shoveling mulch, right? How many of you have those kids? Do me a favor, raise your hands. I'm doing a little study here. It's weird, but we have all these kids that are very sensory and they like that pulling weeds. They get a job in a little neighborhood. It's an awesome thing because now they're out of the house and they're happy with other people and other people are affirming them saying, you're a hard worker, man. I had all this stuff, weeds in my yard and you picked them all up. You're a good worker. And now they're hearing positive things from other people instead of being at home. Why don't you ever focus? You never do anything I ask. By the way, none of your strong-willed kids are going to do their chores at home. They're just not. Just give up on it. It's useless. My son was useless as a kid. He was awesome as an adult, and he's awesome for other people. I'm kind of kidding with that, but how many of you have found that to be true? And you're going to have to wrestle with it. And what we eventually came to with Casey when he was about 12 or 13, because he started working out of the home when he was young. And he was really hard worker, really disciplined for everybody else. And what we finally wrestled with was not so awesome at home, but we're raising him to be responsible in the real world. And he is. And you're going to have multiple kids, right? You're going to be like, but they all have to do the same amount of chores because that's fair. That's not working either because here's what's going to happen. The strong-willed child is going to pay his one sister to do the chores <laughs> and manipulate the other one. And your appropriate response is, Mike, that's good thinking because doing chores is boring. But you're really gifted at making money. So with that money, you pay your one sister. That's called delegation. And you're going to need that in life because you're never going to keep a job anywhere because you don't like authority figures. You're going to end up owning your own business after jail. So <laughs> you've got to figure... I'm kidding. They're not going to go to jail. But... And... Watch, there's a lot of stuff deep in here. How many of your kids, you would say, are sometimes manipulative? <laughs> Again, watch how often we go to the negative. Do you know what it really is? They understand human nature. They're observers. They're thinkers. They know exactly what subtle little thing to do to you to push your buttons, and then something else to push your spouse's buttons, and each of the kids, and we always take that as he's manipulative, he's pushing buttons, and we never stop to think the reason he's so good is because he understands human nature, and that's a great quality. And whenever I talk to strong-willed kids, what I tell them is I want to use that for good because you've got great insight, you've got a big heart, you know what it feels like to suffer and feel different. So if you will use that instead of manipulating people to get what you want, if you use that quality to serve other people, one, you can make money doing that, serving other people, and you'll have a fulfilling life. Does that make sense? So try not to focus always on the negative and react to it because it's a really cool thing. So Mike, you're really good at influencing and you just picked out the fact that your sister has low self-esteem and doesn't really care about herself a lot, and so you manipulate her. And you know whose issue in this scene, this scene is about? It's hers. And you need to talk to your daughter and say, you need to be confident in yourself and, and have self-respect and demand money from your brother. Otherwise, <laughs> seriously, is that not true? Otherwise, you know what's going to happen? You're going to grow up and marry a controlling man because that's what 40% of you in here did, true? Look, this stuff always comes back to us. So here's where we're going to go. One more thing, strong-willed kids. Strong-willed kids will never do things the way you want them done. They're not going to do it your way. You know why? Because your way is boring, duh, stupid. <laughs> and, the re and this is a good thing. Now, it's irritating. And I'm not talking about let your kids do whatever they want. Not into permissive parenting but they're not going to do it your way. And the reason is because they're stove touchers. How many of your kids, they have to touch the hot stove. It, it's another phenomenal quality that we want in kids. We want kids, but, you, but what we do as modern day parents is they never get a chance to own their own choices because we're always over dictating everything and controlling them. When you and I were kids, because he's about my age, when we grew up, our parents weren't even around. 
Every afternoon we were gone for two or three hours. True? Summertime. We didn't see our parents till dinner time. You and I were out in the neighborhood playing, doing mischievous stuff, hitting cars with snowballs. We used to put things in the road that cars ran over. We were awful as kids, but nobody thought of it because nobody knew what we were doing. <laughs> True? He and I got in a fight because we played kill the guy with the ball. Remember that game? That was awesome. And we got in a fight because he bloodied my lip and we made up. We learn how to make choices and be responsible for ourselves. If you want your kids to be responsible for themselves, you have to stop being responsible for them. So one of our key phrases and principles is, when we step back, it gives our kids space to step up and be responsible for themselves. When we step back from lecturing, lecturing is not teaching, it's micromanaging. And if we're honest with ourselves, you know what we're really saying? I don't trust you to make good choices, and I'm going to lecture you, and I'm going to be all over you because I don't trust that you can actually be successful. True? So I would go home and apologize. Say this to your kids, especially older kids. Hey, does it ever feel like we're always all over you? Do we lecture too much? And they're going to be like, mm hmm <laughs> Then I apologize. I'm sorry because I think I've sent the message that you're not capable, but I believe you are capable. But here's what it's going to look like. You're going to start doing things on your own, and you're going to touch the hot stove, and you're going to fail a couple times. And that's part of the process. And you're going to wrestle with it, and you're going to struggle. And you're going to want to give up. Of course you are, because it's hard doing those things. But I believe that you can use your persistence and your creativity, and you can overcome that. And when you do, man, it's going to feel really good. And then you have to step back and give your kids a little bit of space. So when we step back from lecturing, from micromanaging, from fixing everything for our kids, I want your kids to get used to the fact that life is filled with disappointment. Because if they're gonna be a Redskins fan, they're gonna have to get used to it growing up. Thank God for the Nationals. So, at least for a little while until they get swept by the, I'm kidding, they're not gonna, they're gonna do fine. So, so ownership, let's talk about ownership. Um, yeah, let me do ownership really quickly. I don't want to give kids control of my home or my classroom, but I want to give them something called ownership. Let me give you two examples of ownership. Ownership is this. Here are my objectives. Here's what I want. Clear expectations. But within these boundaries that I give you, this big box, I give you some space to do things and do them differently than I would do them as long as we accomplish the same tasks. Does that make sense? I'm not saying if you want to do your homework. Oh, homework's getting done. Don't care how you do it. You want to do your homework standing up at the kitchen counter, eating a snack, listening to music, go for it. If you want to do homework sitting in a closet, if you want to do homework, by the way, your kids who shovel mulch, this is a weird idea, but I guarantee you they will do it. You, outside is phenomenal. You know why? Because you're not near you. And it gives them ownership, and it's your anxiety that dumps on them. And I'm not blaming you, but I am. So I'm kidding, I'm not. There's no blame or guilt. It's just realizing this is the way it works. I have so many kids, if you give them a job and they go down to an old, older couple's home down the street in your neighborhood and help them with yard work or changing light bulbs, if you let them do their homework at that other person's house or sitting out on that mulch pile, they'll do their homework. It's weird, but it's just so different. It's neat. So let me give you two examples of ownership. Um, my two daughters here, you're going to be the mean one, says something mean to our sister. My natural response is, is, as the mother or father is, young lady, you need to apologize to your sister right now. And you can guarantee as you, soon as you demand something right now, the child's going to say, no. If you don't apologize right now, I'm going to take away everything you own. Fine. Sorry, stupid sister. <laughs> How many of you get that, right? And some of you are like, pretty close to an apology. I think I'll take it, right? you're going to have to grade on a curve with the strong-willed children because they're not going to do things the way that you want because you want them to say, sister, I'm so sorry that I said something mean. That must have hurt your feelings. Eh, they're never going to say that. So what if I were to come up to my daughter and say, hey, honey, I know that when you're ready, you know the right thing to do. And then I walk away and drink because that's really hard to do, right? No drinking, but you're going to feel like it, right? Because now it's out of my control. Here are a couple things I like about it. Certain amount of respect there, honey. I know you know the right thing to do. Why? Because I've modeled it for you a hundred times in our home. When I do something wrong, I apologize. This phrase, when you're ready, I'm going to use it a few times today. I love that phrase. Now, never use it this way. Hey, son, when you're ready, get your shoes on. We need to go. <laughs> never like that. 
but in an emotional power struggle situation, here's what it does. By the way, how many of you are by nature more of a, a compliant rule following person? Oh, that's a lot. So, including our cameraman back there, right? So, when someone asks you to do something, your natural impulse is to do it. Mine's not. Just look for a different way. And that's not a bad thing. It's a good thing. It just means they're a pain in the butt to raise. But see if this makes sense. If I stand over a strong-willed child and demand something, they will always resist. True? You've got to get this, have your husbands come out tonight because men all want to do this. You know, it's going to be my way or the highway. I'll show them. No, you're not. You can be six foot four and 250. I'm putting 500 bucks on the seven-year-old because he will <laughs> own you. They have an iron will. You can't push these kids. You have to lead them. You have to draw them. Humility, by the way, is a powerful tool because I know your instinct is, you know what? I'm not going to do that in this home. And that my instinct is to go like this and just go kind of harsh with, you know, to your room right now. It doesn't work with these kids. The humility that you use, and I'll do some examples after this one, will break down those walls. Many of your kids feel very different. They feel under, misunderstood. They feel like life is swimming upstream. For those of you who are compliant rule followers, life is set up for you. School's awesome because school is about going and sitting and listening and raising your hand eh, eh, and doing all that stuff. But imagine that your brain was wired, I believe intentionally, to be totally opposite of that. And you have to go through your entire life. You know what it feels like? It feels like everybody's against me. How many of your kids have said that before? And that's a real feel. I'm 53. I get that. Now I'm growing up so I can take it. And I embrace it and I like it because I don't want to be like everybody else. But when you're a kid and it feels like that, man, that is a tough, I'm telling you, they're not so much defiant as they are very frustrated kids. And if you can get to the frustration. So here's what that, that phrase, when you are ready, see if this makes sense. It almost releases the child to do what they're supposed to do. But I said, when you're ready, I know you knew the right thing to do. And I removed myself to give her space to wrestle with her little feelings. Now, here's the hard part. She's not going to apologize anytime soon. You're going to be laying in bed talking to your spouse thinking, are we raising a sociopath? Because she hasn't apologized. But tomorrow morning, she's going to wake up and do something thoughtful for her sister as an act of contrition. And your appropriate response is, nice job, honey. So you did. Shows me you're growing up. By the way, Praise for strong-willed kids, very low-key. Not that big, oh, honey, I'm so proud of you, because here's what it sounds like. I never thought you'd actually make a good choice, <laughs> and you just did. And it sounds condescending and fake. It also puts pressure on kids. When I talk to kids and say, I believe you're capable of handling this, see, that's imparting confidence. Of course you're going to struggle with this, but I believe you're capable of doing it. Does that make sense? Great phrase. And when I say, hey, nice job, like how you did that, it's a good choice. Short and sweet. Don't labor, don't stand there waiting for them to say, you're a good mom too, right? It's awkward, right? <laughs> well, why don't you thank me for it? Well, that's your issue. You're a grown up, okay? Start acting like it. By the way, you said I could be blunt. Stop taking everything so personally. I can't believe that my daughter would talk to me like that. You're a freaking 40 year old. Grow up. True? <laughs> True? Okay. Well, but I do everything for them. Your <laughs> issue. Your kids are never going to wake up and say, listen, mom, my brother and I had a talk. We've determined you do way too much for us. <laughs> Not going to happen. You're doing way too much because there's something inside of you. That's a subtle form of manipulation that some of your mothers used, right? Now they still use the guilt trips on you. Break that pattern. That's within you. Because I think if I'm nice to everybody, then they owe me. So I'm not doing that. And then your kids, you know why they don't, they don't respect you sometimes? This is kind of harsh. It's because you don't respect yourself, and they know it. You just do everything for everybody else, and then you get resentful. That's your issue. And I'm not being mean with that. That's, that's liberating, because you have complete power to change yourself, which is awesome. So, does that make sense? One more ownership, and then I'm going to get to a couple other things. So, here's a morning routine one. It's kind of fun, but I love it. So, Mike, here's the deal. School bus comes, carpool leaves every morning at 7.22 a.m. I have one goal for you every morning. On the bus in the car, 7.22. I don't care what you look like. I don't care what you smell like. I don't care what's in your stomach. Just be on that bus at 7.22. 
If you're smart enough to wear the clothes to bed at night that you're going to wear to school the next morning, you can sleep until 721, roll out of bed, grab that Pop-Tart from underneath your bed, because I know you hide food in your bedroom. You run out to the school bus. You don't even have to have your shoes on. But as long as you make the school bus at 722, at the end of the day, you know what my response is? Good job. Nice job getting ready, my friend. Now, inside, do you know what I'm thinking? <sighs> I hate the way he gets ready because he procrastinates, and that bothers me because I want him to get up early and get exercise and eat blueberries and avocado and have good, healthy fat so his brain's ready to learn. And I want all those things. But the more you're on your child and badgering them in the morning, the more they're going to resist. True? And they're not rejecting you, they're rejecting your anxiety. Because you're afraid that they're not going to be successful, and I need you to do the right thing, and you've got to get up, and you've got to get da, 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 da. And I promise you, if you will start stepping back a little bit and giving them space to do things in weird ways, they'll come up with their own way of doing it. It's just going to irritate the crap out of you, because many of you have, how many of you have control issues? Okay, the rest of you are lying. We all have control issues, right? Serbians are very controlling people. I know that. It's true, isn't it? They are. They're, you're tough. So, and so that's your issue because I want it. I, I'll try to talk louder. So this is awesome. We got the tractor man coming outside, and it's awesome. Focus. So. That's so awesome. So he's probably a strong-willed guy. He's like, look. Look at Valerie's running down the thing. That's awesome. That's so awesome. Anyway, that's awesome. Okay. Come on, we don't have a lot of time. Focus. So, so I want him to eat healthy. I want him to do those things. But the more that I badger him, okay? The more that I badger him, the less it's going to work. So give your kids ownership. Let me do this. It's what I usually start with. I'm going to do it very quickly. The only person in life that you can control is whom? ourselves, right? How many of you uh, ever tell your kids, you need to calm down and get control of yourself, right? How many of you did that this morning, right? I'm going to the calm workshop. You guys need to get ready for school, right? And your kids are like, mom, hope this is a three-day workshop, right? <laughs> Look, this is the most important part of the whole day. Quickest way to change a child's behavior is to first control your own. I don't have time to do all of this this morning, but watch your body posture, watch your tone of voice. Body posture is huge. I'm a big fan of sitting. I'm going to do an example with that. I'm a big fan. I'll show you in a minute. Tone of voice has to be even matter of fact. And you've heard throughout how I've talked to Mike has been very even matter of fact. I don't like the sweetie baby. Sweetie baby. It sounds condescending and your kids see her as weakness. I wouldn't refer to myself as mommy needs you to do or daddy when giving instructions to a strong-willed child. It sounds sweet, but they don't respect it. I talk to three-year-olds, 30-year-olds, everybody like they're an adult. There's something very grounding about this very even matter-of-fact tone. The moment you start to get a little bit, as soon as this gets in your voice, you may as well drink. You're done. End of the day. Guys, all I'm asking for is a little bit of help around here. All your kids know is, Mom, you're exhausted. I'm going to own you in about 12 seconds. Give me what I want, right? Again, that's you've got moms in here, especially have to practice self-care. Stop making everything about the kids because you get worn down. I was just reading this morning because Casey and I are reading Russian literature for some reason. And we're reading about Tolstoy. And Tolstoy, in 1896, identified that women as a whole, even back then, do everything for everybody else and nothing for themselves, and in doing so, make themselves so exhausted that they then can't help anybody. Does that make sense? So taking care of yourself is a gift that you give your kids, as we're going to see in a moment. But tone of voice, even matter of fact, I don't like the sweetie tone. I don't like the screaming and yelling because that doesn't work. Because as soon as you start to yell, your kids know, if I just push your buttons, you're going to be out of control, and then I'm in control. So right in between is this. This says that I'm in control of myself. I'm not going to repeat myself 14 times. I'm not going to scream and yell. So let me do two examples in this um, to demonstrate this. So sibling issues. So I've got Mike is going to be the uh, provoking child, right, the son. Uh, because it's always a provoking child and a child who reacts. And then his sister is going to be the one who reacts. Now, if you open up your handout, if you got a handout to celebrate Calm One, on the second page, you'll see a chart, excuse me, with three columns. 
And on that um, third column there is about the need for brain stimulation. Many of your kids don't get enough dopamine or blood flow. Brain is physiologically understimulated. And as you go down the chart, that's where all the fidgeting, tapping pencils, procrastination, arguing, all of that come in, for, it stimulates the brain. So Mike gets bored, what does he do? Looks at his sister, or pokes her, or better yet, almost pokes her. Sister dutifully reacts to it. Mom comes into the room, after all I do for you, I buy all these toys and video games, you can't even play well together for 20 minutes, one day you're gonna be best friends. Uh, <laughs> meaningless, right? They already had their own drama, and what happens? I bring in my own drama. Now, who comes in next? Dad, because he hears his wife upset. And nothing freaks us out more than our wives upset because we barely know what to do with you when everything's okay, but when you're upset, <laughs> freaks us out, right, man? True? So now watch what happened, and this is important. I came in, leave your sister alone. And I just, what's he looking for? Brain stimulation. So your kids aren't looking for your attention. The brain is drawn to intensity. They want intensity, but I want to give them positive intensity. And so watch, here's what this one child learned. By looking at my sister, I can get three people in my home really upset. And you know whose issue that is? The other three people. True? It's not right of him to do it, but everybody else reacts. And inadvertently, when I come in the room, leave your sister alone, I just reinforced, if you want intensity, do something wrong. Does that make sense? Now I just reinforced to my daughter, you're a helpless victim. Look, your childhood's going to be miserable. Till he goes off to college or jail, you're going to be miserable. And I can't help you. Because I just blame that whole scene on her brother. And it's not all her brother. Now, in cases of a kid where kids are being physical with another child, that's a different case, right? But I'm talking about just bugging each other. Because you do have a choice in how you react. So I just reinforce that by coming in and getting frustrated. And I send them to the rooms. Does that really solve anything? No, you just separate them. And now you've become the referee. And it's going to happen a million times over. Imagine that we talked about body posture. Mom, you walk into that room and lie down right in the middle of the living room floor. Because she did that today, uh, sometime. It's weird and it feels stupid. But I guarantee you those two kids are going to stop squabbling <laughs> because they're going to look at you like, what are you doing laying down on the floor? Lay on, top of me. lay on top of you. That's connection time. And now watch, it is connection time, and now watch what I've demonstrated. Now that they've stopped, I'm in control, mm -hmm. and I can teach. Mm -hmm. Stop doing that isn't teaching. It's just frustration, and it's just me spouting stuff. When I come and sit down, go in the living room, go on the sofa, you put your feet up and start reading a book. Mm -hmm. You're going to throw them off. Because just coming in and facing off against kids like this says, I'm frustrated and we're going to have a power struggle, mm -hmm. right? Because you never see a mom and daughter. They never, the conversation never goes like this. You know what, honey? I'm really proud of your choices, <laughs> right? It doesn't. And that's body posture. Mm -hmm. you, if you sit down, it's really hard to lecture and yell at your kids. I know that sounds stupid, but you're busy people. And you can't come up with what's the 10-step calm process. All I know is in a moment, if, I've, if Casey and I, my son, when he was a teenager, if we started to argue, if I sat down, it changed the dynamic. Because my natural impulse with my son was to step up in his face. And that's just going to escalate every time, because they're going to get bigger than you, too. <laughs> so now I have an opportunity to teach. So Mike, and again, same tone of voice. I've seen this scene unfold in our home. 18 times this week. Mike, here's what happens. You've got this awesome brain. It needs to be stimulated. A lot of ideas in there, man. It's partly why you blurt out school. It's why you forget to turn in your homework. It's a busy brain. It's filled with ideas. And it's really awesome. But when you get bored, you need it stimulated. So what you normally do is you pick on your sister. But what ends up happening is two things. One is it makes you weak because you need your sister to react. And then you lose all your stuff. So we can continue to do that if you want, but your childhood's going to be pretty miserable. But, and again, I go back to, 
If you want to learn how to uh, uh, start a little business, do something productive. I can go to like your grandma's sick if you, and you're really awesome at drawing. If you want to come in and make the world's biggest get well card for your grandmother, that'd be pretty awesome too. But I'm showing them different things, to, different ways to get the brain stimulated because that's the real issue. That's not a sibling issue. That's a brain stimulation issue. True? And I give them an option and with my daughter I can say, honey, if all you're ever going to do is react to irritating people or situations in life, you're going to be miserable. I can't help you with that. But I can show you how to control yourself and respond differently to your brother so you don't give him complete power over you. Because kids like that language. You just gave your brother complete power. You're your brother's puppet. I am nobody's puppet. You're your brother's puppet. He looks at you and you react. But I can show you a different way to handle that. Again, the tone is, it's up to you guys. I can't make you stop. True? You can't really make them. You can threaten stuff, but it doesn't do anything. You put them in their rooms and they're still going to be like yelling at each other through the walls. But now I'm teaching them. And we mentioned before as well, sometimes sibling issues are a confidence issue. I don't feel good about myself. I have the perfect sister. What am I likely to do? I'm going to put her down. Why? Because... So it's a confidence issue, and again, getting kids focusing on the positive, using their gifts, talents, and passions, getting little jobs, doing things that they're good at doing, that's what builds confidence, not self-esteem telling them they're great. You get confidence by doing things well. It's just that in our society, what we ask our kids to do is do everything you're not good at doing. Sit still, memorize information, take tests on information you're never going to use in life. Happy childhood, right? and you're not good at any of those things. So I'll get to that a little bit later. Let me do this example, uh, this one. So one of the biggest triggers for men, and I'll do this one tonight because there'll be more men out here tonight, but I want you to share this stuff with your husbands too because your husbands are really important in this. Look, I get emails every day from parents. Um, nine paragraphs about how their son has uh, uh, some different issues with controlling themselves. Last paragraph, by the way, my husband has some anger issues and doesn't get along with my son. Oh, I didn't need the previous nine. Father and son aren't getting along, father and daughter, guess what? Look, I, I don't want to forget to say this. Policies, consequences don't change behavior. Relationships change behavior. We've had social policy in our country for 200 years. It doesn't change behavior. Human relationships change behavior. Does that make sense? Look, and your, your kids don't care about consequences, true? doesn't matter. I'm going to go way beyond consequence. I'm fine with consequence. Take away their stuff, but you're going to run out of stuff to take away because you're not getting to the root of the issue, right? And I'll do that in a minute. So one of the biggest um, uh, triggers is if a man walks in a room and I hear my child yelling at my wife, freak. So in this situation, Mike's going to be the son. You're going to be the mom. So I walk in. I hear him yelling at my wife. Mike, you know, what were you thinking? How many times do I have to tell you? You don't yell at your mother. And that's key for me, like I'm going to unload. You don't pick up your toys. How are you ever going to be successful in life? To your room for the rest of the week, no video games, no food. Because I'm a man, I give consequences I can't keep, right? How many of the men in here do that, right? <laughs> no video games the rest of the week while I'm away on a business trip. It's a great one. <laughs> See, mom has to deal with it. So I walk away thinking, I just stood up for my wife. And you know what my wife's thinking? No, you didn't. You just ruined the whole night. Because now I've got to spend two hours up in our son's bedroom calming him down, explaining that your father doesn't hate you. He just has some unresolved issues from childhood, right? And now I get resentful. You know why? Because I wouldn't have to yell at your son if you weren't so soft on him and let him get away with things. That's good for your marriage as well, right? One of you is going to be a little bit softer. One's going to be a little bit harder. And so that's why you need to come in between there, right? And I get why you let your kids get away with things at times because some days you just have to make it through the day and not murder your child, true? And so I want you to be consistent, but I want to give you permission. Some days, you just got to feed them the mac and cheese. Mac and cheese and chicken nuggets, 18 straight days. I don't care. Just eat. <laughs> eat outside. I just want to get through that night, right? It doesn't have to be that whole idea of the perfect family doesn't exist. It's supposed to be messy. It's supposed to be hard. It has been since the beginning of time. It's supposed to be hard because human relationships aren't about happiness. They're about transformation. It makes you into a different person. The strong-willed child is going to root out of you your selfishness, your control issues, and your anxiety. And it's bring it all to the fore. Right? 
I guarantee you the quickest way to change your child's behavior if you spend the next 30 days learning how to control yourself and your anxiety over your child mm -hmm. and your reactions to your child and your tone of voice, mm -hmm. you will see changes in your child much more quickly than any consequences or policy we can give. Does that make sense? It's not a blame or guilt. It's a simple recognition of there's one person in life that I can control. And I use that everywhere in life. At a restaurant, if the waiter's kind of has a bad attitude, Casey and I have a little thing, we're gonna be like, let's try to turn them. Yep. And we try to turn that instead of like, you're waiting, you're serving us, you're supposed to have a good attitude. That's helpful. <laughs> it's easier to think, well, maybe they've had a really bad day and they just had a demanding table. And when we control ourselves and our response to them, we usually turn them and then Casey and I are like, that's pretty easy. Yeah. Not always. But it's a really cool thing when I focus on controlling myself instead of other people in life and instead of, anyway. So, different way to handle this. Um, before we discipline, I'm going to discipline my son, you have to de-escalate. Because what we typically do in the middle of that situation, Mike, Mike, you know, you know, one more word, young man, one more word, which is cue for them to say, word, yeah. right, make you upset. <laughs> or I used to do this one, you know what, keep it up, keep it up. You've already lost your video games for one week. You want to make it two? And the strong will child is going to be like, let's make it four. And inside, you're going to be like, right? You're going to swear, OK? You said I could be brutally honest. I wish your husbands were here, because this is kind of a guy thing, but also for moms, too. When my son was younger, and that's how this all came about with Casey, very strong-willed, and then I began to change. We lived out in Ashburn. And so when we changed, we ended up inviting these kids into our home. So we'd have, we had 1,500 kids like this in our home over the course of a decade. That's where a lot of this comes from, a lot of science and research. But what I was saying to my son was this, because I could tell he was upset. You can see their faces are all red, and you can tell he's gone. And then I keep going, you know, keep, keep, keep it up, young man. I was provoking him. That's pure, pro you know what else is provoking? This is going to sting. You talk too much. You just keep going. I'm not being mean. But if you want things to change, you've got to stop talking. You can't calm a child down by talking them through it. I mean, you notice it makes them more angry. It's provoking a child to anger. Well, let me just repeat it one more time. <laughs> I know it stings a little bit. I want it to sting. I don't like blame and guilt, but I like stinging because then it's like, okay, I need to change that, right? It's so all I want is ownership. Own my part in this. It's all I want. Like one politician one day to say, you know why I lost the election? Because I'm not trustworthy. I'd vote for him the next time. Do you know what I mean? Like own it sometime. And that's not any political party. That's all of them. So true. I just want you to, own, I want to own my stuff. I wish Dan Snyder would own like, I'm awesome at business, but I suck at owning the Redskins. Yes. A little bit of humility would be nice. So in this situation, you know what I was really saying to my son? I need you to behave because if you don't behave and you don't do what I say, I'm not sure I can behave and you do not want to see me angry. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? I became dependent on my son. I need you to behave because if you don't do what I say, I'm just going to lose it. And that makes me very, very weak in him and control. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So, but we're going to see the opposite part of it. So, in order to de-escalate, here's the phrase we use. Motion changes emotion. Motion or movement is a tool that helps the child go from being really upset to calming down because talking doesn't work. I also don't like really sweet, honey, I can tell you're really upset. <laughs> that makes it worse because it sounds like you're not taking it seriously. There's no need to be upset. Wives, you like that from your hubby? You're just overreacting. And you're like, and you're not sleeping with me tonight, <laughs> right? So. I want to use motion. Sometimes I do the example of a child in um, Target, Nile 2. He's freaking out on the floor. You have every right to say, get up off the floor. Tends to escalate. Dad gets down on the floor and does a few push-ups, looks up at the child and says, hey, you want to do 10 with me? Because if you did 10 push-ups every time you got upset, you'd be ripped, right? <laughs> Don't say that part, but I invite them in and show them a different way. You've got to show your kids a different way to handle their frustration, right? Talking them through it, having a calming routine. I like code words. Here's a weird one. How many of you have kids who like to, um, they'll take the cushions off the sofa, lay on the hard part of the sofa, right? So we look at all these things and we think, that's weird. Observe your kids. They'll tell you everything they need by what they do. Some of you have kids, when they come home from school, they hide under something. Good. So now, 
That's my calming routine. It's where I want you to do homework. It's a safe place. At school, by the way, let the, your kids, ask the teacher, can my son or daughter take, uh, can I, they take their test sitting underneath their desk at school? I just put parameters. You're not going to play with other people's feet. You're not going to make any noise. But if that's where you do homework and do your classwork best, get under your table. Because a lot of kids like the confined space. It feels safe and nobody's looking over them. So don't be afraid to do things differently. Um, so anyway, I had these kids at our house, and I noticed they do the sofa thing. So I came up with this idea when they were upset. I'd say, hey, I can tell you're frustrated. Sofa. One word, code word. Sofa. Their job in that moment, because they couldn't calm down. Their job was to go in and throw the cushions off the sofa, because they were upset. They weren't going to place them down nicely. They're not in the moment. Throw them down, lay on the hard part of the sofa. I would come in, put the cushions on top of them, and then I would sit on top of them. And they were instantly calm. The physical pressure felt good, and I wasn't looking them in the eyes. Don't look your kids in the eyes when they're upset, because they're ashamed of themselves when they're upset, and it just highlights that. Please tell your husbands, and for the men in here, all I can tell you is trust me with this. This whole thing, like, look at me, look me in the eyes when I'm talking to you. Every man in the history of the universe has taken that as disrespect. It's not disrespect. Most of the kids I work with think best when they're not looking an adult in the eyes because they process. Look, you'll notice me. I close my eyes. I look up. I look down. I process better that way. And most of the time, the only time dad ever says, look at me, look at me, right? Yeah. It's never, look at me, proud of you, good choice. Like, we never do that. But I want you to, because that's the kind of intensity, that was a good choice, my friend. Love how you did that. It's the way we roll in my home. See, that's good intensity right there. You can use your intensity, right? I like the way you did that. Shows me you're growing up. See, that's a great, and then walk away. Little seeds planted there. Anyway, so we're going to use motion. I'm going to give you two examples here. There are hundreds. Say I walk in, I'm like, Mike, I can tell you're frustrated. Listen, and I hold up a football because I like nonverbals. When you're ready, if you want to come outside, I'll play catch with you. Mike, I can tell you're frustrated. Listen, I'm going to dump some Legos out on the floor. When you're ready, if you want to come build a spaceship, that'd be cool. Could use your help. Couple things here. When I'm walking in, I've got a little bit of intensity, but it's going toward problem solving. I like acknowledging. I can tell you're frustrated because that's what we all want when we're upset. Totally get that you're frustrated, honey. Zip. That's all you want from your husband. True? Don't need me to fix it? Please tell your husbands that because we think we, you want us, want us to fix things. And that's our na nature. So just say, honey, when I'm having a bad day, here's what I need you to do. Just say one sentence. I can tell that you're frustrated. And then I want you to shut up. And don't say another word. Don't fix it. Don't do anything. Con t be specific with men because we tend to, we, we're, we're not good at this stuff. I'm not making excuses, but it's pretty clear that we're not. Right? It's true. And so we say things like, well, I don't feel valued in the home. I don't know what that, I don't know what that means. I go to work every day at a job I've hated for 12 years with a boss I've wanted to murder so we have money so our son can go to a good school and we live in a good neighborhood. That's how I show you that, right? But, but anyway, that's a whole separate thing on the marriage stuff. But anyway, you've got to be specific about what that means. What I finally found out, I'll give you my one thing. I have my own business, so I'm always working in the football season. I love being on my laptop watching football on Sunday. And I'd always like look up my wife on work and working. I was like, there's a little bit of eye contact, two or three seconds. She feels valued. No. <laughs> so one day, I closed my laptop and gave her eye contact. And she said, that's what I wanted. And I was like, why didn't you tell me that? Like five years ago. I'm a dumb man. Closed laptop, good. <laughs> My wife likes it. And she's like, well, what you just showed me is I'm more important than your laptop. But we don't put, uh, so be assertive and say, it would mean, here's a great phrase, it would mean a lot to me if you would. You want another one? I don't know why we're doing this, but somebody needs it. We all need this. And it's because there are not a lot of men in here, a lot of uh, moms and wives. Honey, I know you probably, you probably don't know that you're doing this, but when you prove your point, it makes me feel that tall. When you counter everything I say, it doesn't make me thankful that I married a know-it-all. <laughs> it makes me feel that small. And I thought, when, or hubby, when you come in and you get the kids all upset, now I've got three boys and I think I married another one. I thought I married a man. 
And if you want me to treat you like a man, <clears throat> you know what I'm talking about. Deep emotional connection. No sex. If you want me to treat you like a man, I need you to start acting like a man in a home. That will get his attention. Does that make sense? I'm not saying use sex as a weapon, but it does work. So I'm just kidding. No, it's a, I have no problem with that at all. If you want, look, if you're going to come home and demean me every day and dismiss everything and then expect later I'm going to come up and be vulnerable with you in bed, it's not how it works. You come home and make me feel safe and valued, I'll get babysitter, right? <laughs> Seriously, you're married. Start doing that stuff. I guarantee You've gotten in bad habit. You're just in a habit. You don't connect anymore because life's hard and you've got strong-willed kids and you don't agree on how to raise a strong-willed child and now you're separated with everything. Next week, sometime this week, I want you to do it. Have fun. Be like a teenager again, right? But you're married. It's legal now. You can do whatever you want. There's no moral thing against doing it. Go have sex in your minivan. I'll change your marriage. I'm not kidding with that. I'm serious. You have to do some things to break out of the ruts, right? Now, you got to weigh that because some of you are married to someone, blah, blah, you've got other issues. But anyway, no, I mean, there are deep issues in there. So let's read. So here's what I like about it. when I came in, I like that I acknowledge she's doing no, I like the nonverbal. I like holding up the football because it's just it's kind of it's an invitation. I'm leading the child. Right. Hey, when you're ready, come outside. Hey, I'm going to go in the living room and I'm leading the child. Does that make sense? I'm giving them something to do, giving me something to do, playing catch with a child out. And I know you can't always go outside and play catch. It's just an example. That calms me down. Building with Legos, here's why I like it. I like tactile stuff for kids. Because when kids are upset, here's what they're thinking. I'm angry, I'm frustrated. I don't know how to calm down. But I do know how to build with my Legos. How many of you, when life feels like it's out of control at night, how many of you go to your kitchen and clean your kitchen sink? Anybody do that? Right, and here's what you're saying. The rest of my life is out of control. My sink is spotless. And you will walk by it all night long because it's grounding to you. So write down kitchen, find out what that kitchen sink activity is for your child. Because in the middle of a meltdown, when I give them the Legos, everything else is out of control. I'm angry, I'm frustrated. I don't even know why I'm angry half the time. And now I'm building with Legos. See, that makes me feel in control. That feels good. Now, here's what else I like about the, these little scenes. This is hugely important to me. I'm with my son. Usually, you know what? Go to your room. Nothing wrong with that. But I just sent him away from the very person who has the wisdom to help him. When we're together building with Legos, playing catch, you know what I just demonstrated to my son? And this is the most important thing probably the whole day. When your world is out of control, mine's not. I can handle you at your worst. That's huge. Because when your kids get to be teenagers, that's what I want. I want them to come to you. Some of you have boys, they're going to get hooked up in, you know, kids in here. Porn and other stuff is just going to happen. And I don't want them hiding it. I want them to be able to come to their dad and say, Dad, found some stuff on the internet. I'm, I, it, it's messing with me. But if you're going to be like, you know, how, how many times have I told you not to do with that? Right? Then they're not coming to you. But I want them to be, be able to come to you and be able to trust that you're not going to overreact and lecture and get on them so that you, the very person who has wisdom to help can do it. Does that make sense? It is a, I will tell you, the most emotional uh, uh, worst power struggles are an opportunity to teach your kids that I am a trustworthy person that you can count on. And it's connection. You've got to connect with these kids. So now we go into discipline because he and I, we've calmed down now. I don't want to wring his neck anymore. And so now I've calmed down. Now here's some good discipline language. And we'll take a break in a few minutes, but let me get through this. So Mike, here are a couple things I know based on this yelling at your mom. I know that you know yelling at your mother is inappropriate and wrong. I love that phrase for your kids. I know you know that's wrong, because here's the opposite. What were you thinking? How many times do I have to tell you? That's shaming words that literally mean you are an idiot. How many wives in here allow your husband to say, honey, what were you thinking? Because you'd be like, oh, I was rethinking my marriage choice. That's what I was thinking, right? <laughs> I know you know that's wrong. And I know that you know yelling at your mother, hitting your sister, lying, stealing, whatever it is, always brings dire consequences. You lose your stuff. So I'm curious. I love the phrase, I'm curious. It's a great phrase. 
I'm curious means I want to understand. So I'm curious, what went on today? What's going on inside of you that would lead you to yell at your mother knowing that that causes you to lose everything you own, right? Does that make sense? Because it's not rational that they would do it. See if this makes sense a little bit deeper. Traditional discipline at times is me against you. You know what? I, I, I don't have time for this. How, how, how many times? Can you hear it? It's all about my frustration. What are you doing? What are you, and it's my own anxiety because I don't see him living up to his potential and his behavior's not good and is it going to be, right, what's going to happen to him in the future and all these things go through my head. And so it becomes kind of me against you. I don't know how many times I tell you, if you don't stop that, and then we go consequence. The I'm curious in this approach is I'm kind of coming alongside of Mike and saying, Mike, I'm not mad at you. The reason I want you to stop yelling at your mother, hitting your sister, doing all those things is it hurts you. Because once you do those things, you beat yourself up inside, which I guarantee your kids do. Because how many of your kids, after they've gone to the room, come downstairs, Mom, I'm sorry. And we'll say, well, why did you do it? I don't know. And that's what we're here for, to figure out. That's what I'm trying to get to, what's going on. And what I usually heard from my son is, Dad, I'm frustrated at school. How many of your kids hold it together for the teachers at school? Come home, unload on the parent, right? So now I can say, hey, you know the right thing to do. Go apologize to your mom and grab your backpack. We're going to go out through the front door. I'm going to teach you three different ways to deal with your frustration so that tomorrow and the next day and the next day and the next day, when you come home from frustrated from school, which you're pretty much going to do every day because school's kind of stupid and you're smarter than everybody in your own brain, and partly it's true, is I want to show you how so you don't yell at mom and lose all your stuff. And I just taught them a different way. Couple quick things. After school, if your kids don't like school, don't ask them how their day was. Hey, how was your day at that place where you're on red on the behavior chart and don't have any friends? Right? That's pretty much what it sounds like. How, here, can you hear the anxiety? How did, you, how did you do on that test today? Because I want to know that you did well, that you studied, that you did well so that you can graduate, so you can go to college, so you can get a job, so you can get a wife, so you can leave my home. It's all in there, and they feel this pressure. So when kids get home from school, younger kids, um, I may give them that treasure hunt thing. Give them something they feel in control. Hey, hit something in the backyard in the basement, but you can't find it in the next seven minutes. Kids love treasure hunts. Could be your husband may say, hey, listen, mom's on the way home from work. When she gets home, why don't you hide something? We'll see if mom can find it in the basement. They like stumping their parents. Gives them something in control of. Older kids, great conversation starter. Hey, something happened to me today at the office, at the grocery store, at the post office. I'm curious, what would you do if you were in my situation? Now you get them opening up. Because otherwise, if you've got a middle school age boy, here's your conversation. How was school today? Fine. Fine. Got any homework? Nope. Okay. Guess we'll talk tomorrow. Right? And that's pretty much it. <laughs> or they're going to lie. Nope. Did it in study hall. And he didn't. He just lied. But anyway, does that make sense? Let me, do, let me do a couple more examples of tools, and then we'll take a break. Everybody okay? If you need to break, take a break. Take a break. I believe you're capable of sitting for a few more minutes. So we can do that. So tools. Two different ways of, because uh, we've done a lot of stuff in here. I'm, I feel pretty good about it so far. But let me get this tools idea for you. So two ways to handle behavior. Typically, we react to negative behavior, give a consequence, and we're punishing failure. In schools, red, yellow, green behavior charts. Hate those things. They don't work. Because your child's experience is school starts at 8 AM. By 8.05, I'm already on red. So you know what they say inside? If I'm going to be on red today, may as well just double down and make it a bad day, right? So. Because they no, no, no. Oh, by the way, this one. Well, honey, if you have four out of five good days, you can go on the class field trip. May as well tell, tell your daughter, guess what? You're not going because you're going to be good for about three and three quarter days. But watch that stuff. It is so damaging to many of your kids. You may as well just put a big red poster up in their bedroom and say, this is your life. <laughs> right? Is that not true? It is a horrible thing that we're doing to our kids with some of those things. Because here's why. We're only reacting to the outward behavior, and we're not giving them tools. And so the other way of handling behavior is to say, I know my child struggles in this area. What if we were to give him or her two or three different tools to create successes so they didn't fail in the first place, right? So many of you have seen this before, but it's such an easy example. How many of you kids struggle with focus and attention? Pretty common. This is a sensory strip, nothing magical, double-sided tape. On this side, some di different textury strips. Science and research say when kids play with textured objects, it stimulates the brain, actually helps them concentrate. Fidgeting, 
is one of the most helpful things your kids can do. As long as it's not irritating other people, you want your kids fidgeting. Most of you in here fidgeting. You haven't stopped moving your foot, bouncing your legs. Those of you taking notes, it's a form of, you're, look, you're, uh, is that cross stitch? Knitting. knitting. I don't know, I'm a guy. She's <laughs> knitting. But you're knit, she's knitting up here, you know why? Partially because it's really productive, but it keeps your brain engaged. Other, if I said, put that away, look at me like this, you'd start daydreaming, right? You couldn't do it. That's a tool. I want you doing that. I, so here's how we use this. Put this under the child's desk at school. Child can sit in class all day long playing with this sensory strip. Doesn't make any noise. Can't whack his classmate in the face with it because it's taped down. It's not a fidget spinner. Doesn't cause any problems. Doesn't change the whole school day, but a few times, when I was zoning out or I wanted to play with my classmate's face or hair, I had something appropriate to play with. Remember, whenever you take something inappropriate away, you have to replace it with something appropriate. Saying no to things has never worked since the beginning of time. Don't eat from that one tree, Adam. <laughs> Seriously, it doesn't work. So, let me do... Um, let me do this one quickly. Michael's my, uh, remember we talked about Michael, I walk in, I see his legs bouncing the whole day. I know, he needs to move. You've got your legs moving the entire time, and that's awesome. Case and I are like that. At dinner, do you do that at dinner table too? Okay, does it irritate your family? Okay, you can go to lunch with us, and the table will be like that, okay, so good. So, because we have a lot of energy, and that's a good thing for you. But if you, I'm gonna use you as an example. Which, what's your name? Jamie. Jamie, good. So, Jamie's in my class. It's pretty obvious she needs to move. I'm setting up her for, her for failure. You know what, honey? You need to exercise self-control and sit for 50 straight minutes. She's not going to do it. So I'm going to pull Jamie aside and say, Jamie, I need some help. How many of you know magical words for strong-willed kids? They love being helpful to other people. So listen, when I teach in class, my mouth gets dry like it is now, and I know you need to move. I'm not putting a label. It's clear that she has ADHD. I don't need a label. Labels sometimes are even harmful. All I know is if her leg needs to move, that's probably column three needs to stimulate her brain, right? So, Jamie, here's what we're going to do. You and I are going to have a secret signal like the Nationals do in baseball. When I do this or this, here's what I want you to do. You come up to my desk, grab my water bottle. You're going to take it to the back of the room, refill it, bring it back up, sit it down. You're not going to talk to anybody. You're not going to distract anybody. You're going to be Miss Invisible. Usually I do Mr. Invisible. It sounds better than Miss Invisible, but whatever. So. Little kids love that. Older kids get beat up if you call them Mr. Invisible, right? So you change the tone a little bit. But look, notice how I talk to her. You're not going to talk to anybody. You're not going to distract anybody. I didn't use the snotty tone. You know what? Every time I give a job, look, if you talk to me in the snotty tone, you know what I'm going to tell you? Go F yourself. True? But we do it to our kids all the time because we're frustrated with them. And so we do this tone. And then we think they're going to be like, Mom, you're so filled with wisdom. Anyway, but they're not. So, even matter of fact tone. So watch what happens. I notice Jamie's, she's struggling. So rather than waiting for her to fail, I give her the signal. She comes up, grabs the water bottle, takes it back, refills it, and I get to end that scene with, nice job, Jamie. That's the way we do it in my class. Here's why I liked it. It took 23 seconds. I gave her 23 seconds of appropriate movement within my boundaries. It was a very specific concrete job, something she can hold and feel. I didn't say, hey, little child with an ADD brain, if you get bored in my class, run around. Again, does that make sense? Uh, OCD kids, I used to put a red magic marker line on the bottle and say, I need it refilled exactly to that red line. And little OCD kids were in the back like pouring it out and refilling it. That's their kitchen sink because it made them feel grounded. I'd write this phrase down. I just created a success. If I wait long enough, Jamie's in trouble in my class. Now she's on, you're on yellow. You know what your kids happen when they get on yellow? Now they start to, what, 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 the next, next thing I do, some of your kids don't sleep at night because they're afraid of the next day. So you need to tell, talk to the teachers in a kind and respectful way and say, I know what you want and I want the same thing. But instead of just doing, look, if the red, yellow, green behavior chart was gonna work, it would have worked like three years ago. It would have worked back in September. It's not gonna work, so can we give my child tools? Talk to your, so. So watch, I like because I just created a su success and I can teach impulse control this way. Jamie, um, last week you're a good helper. This week I believe you're capable, it's that phrase, sitting for 23 minutes before you need to move. And eventually I get her all the way up to 27 minutes, whatever the time limit is. My metric is I praise for progress, not perfection, mm -hmm. right? 
And tell your husbands that because every man, if he's a, a real man, has expectations that are way too high of their children. And your child's only ever getting to hear, and your husband's here. And what happens in between is a lot of frustration and a lifelong feeling of, I can never please my father. And if you read through history books, you will see that most people who did awful, awful things didn't get affirmation from their fathers. Read it sometime. It's really interesting. So I want to come down to where the child is and build them up. One more, two more examples, and then we'll take a break. I want to do this one because I love this one. How many of your kids struggle with, um, they do homework, forget to turn it in? Okay. So, one of two ways to handle it. Mike, you, know, you did your homework, you need to turn it in. If you don't turn in your homework, I'm going to take away recess and mark you down. It doesn't change anything. I want to go, I want to teach your kids how their brains work. Mike, of course you struggle to remember to turn in your homework because first column on the chart is about kids with busy brains. You've got this busy, busy brain, man, and you're always thinking of ideas. By the way, that's why they blurt out. They blurt out because they have lots of ideas, but they're afraid they're going to forget, and so they blurt out. And all we ever do is shame them because they don't have self-control. Instead, we should be saying, I love your ideas, but I'm going to give you every day when you walk in my classroom three talk tickets. Imagine this is a ticket. Here's how it works, Mike. Every time you get that impulse to blurt out, instead, hold up a ticket. I'll either say, zip it, because I believe you can hold it until after class, or I might give them a little notepad. I've given kids pads with a little light bulb on it, because they're idea people. And you write down your note, put it in the little box on the teacher's desk, and then after class, after lunch, teacher pulls out a couple of them and reads them, so the child feels heard, but they control themselves. Or, go ahead, redeem your ticket, share your amazing off-topic idea, because it's always going to be off-topic, true? <laughs> That's a way of giving him a tool to do that. But what I want to explain to him with turning in his homework, and this was a real life example with this kid is, you've got this busy brain. It's just jumbled in there because you're all filled with ideas and so you struggle with short term memory. You're going to struggle in school because school requires that you have good short term memory and you have a deficit in that area. It's not a disorder, it's just a deficit because the corresponding strength that you have is good strategic thinker. In school, it's good to memorize things. After you get out of school, you never have to memorize things the rest of your life. You have to be a good thinker. So I'd rather you struggle now and be fine in life, but just know you're going to struggle. I'm not making an excuse for him. I'm just letting him know, look, use this for, of course you're going to struggle. See, then they don't feel stupid. Well, why am I always the last one to turn in my test? Why am I so slow at, pro because slower processors are deeper processors and you're a deeper thinker. So being slow doesn't make you dumb. It just means you're a thinker. And so of course you're, you go more slowly. It's not about doing things in a speedy way. Because otherwise he's just going to go through his work really quickly and just, right? And it's gonna, you're going to get careless, sloppy work. And you're going to think, well, he's not applying himself. No, he feels stupid because that's all schools sometimes, and all we do is we reinforce that so he tried to get through it quickly so he didn't feel dumb in front of his classmates, right? This, look, this stuff, I, 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 I'm, tired, I'm a little bit tired, so I'm getting a little bit more emotional with it because I've been gone all week. But man, if you get your head inside some of these kids and understand when they come home from school, look, for seven straight hours, I felt stupid. And all the other kids are like, oh, you did such a good job. You did such a good job. And I get the look from the teacher, right? because I'm the bad kid, and then you come home, it's a wonder sometimes that they're not worse, right? When they go through that, because nobody explains, there's nothing wrong with you. And by the way, most of the stuff that you're working on trying to fix doesn't need to be fixed. Stop being Northern Virginia people, taking your child to a different therapist and different helper to fix every single thing. Some therapy is really helpful. My wife is a therapist, I believe in it, but a lot of therapy is really damaging. Because all it does is reinforce there's something wrong with you. By the way, anxiety. Some kids need to see a therapist for it, and some kids don't. Sometimes you need to normalize it. Of course you're anxious. You should feel. Anxiety is normal. There's nothing wrong with you because you feel anxious and don't want to try new things. New things are scary. You should be a little bit anxious. But I believe you're capable of doing those things, and I give you a tool for it. Does that make sense? But watch in this area, we are so hyped, we think that we can get all these professionals and create like the perfect child so that they're successful. And we spend 85% of our energy fixing everything that's wrong. And meanwhile, all the stuff that they're good at, we ignore because they don't get grades for it. And that, that'll, man, that'll kill your child's confidence. I know you're really great at that, but you don't get a grade for it, so don't do it. 
Instead, let's focus on all the stuff that's really meaningless, but you get an arbitrary grade for it, and your whole life's gonna be dependent on doing things as a child that you're not good at. Welcome to life, right? You know, so I wanna to explain to them, of course, it's gonna, of course you struggle with that because of the way your brain's weird, but I believe you're capable of coming up with a really creative solution to turning in your homework because you're really bright and you're good at inventions and you're good at thinking up stuff. So you know what this kid came up with? He earned some money or stole it from his parents, either way he's resourceful, and he bought a little scanner. You know what he does every day? He goes home, does his homework, scans it into the computer, emails it off to the teacher. Boom, he just turned in his homework. And you know what all of his teachers and his parents said? But that's not the right way. Because when he's older, he's going to have to remember. Yeah, when he's 27, he's going to have to turn in his work because if he doesn't, he doesn't get a paycheck and he's going to starve to death and die. But he's a nine-year-old or a 14-year-old kid. Why don't we go to these kids and say, that was brilliant, my friend. You have enough self-awareness to know that you have a weakness in this area, but you didn't use that as an excuse. You used that corresponding strength of yours to come up with a really creative solution, which, by the way, is what you're going to have to do your entire life life because you are filled with weaknesses and strengths like everybody else it's just that yours get magnified in school does that make sense and it's a cool thing so i want to take a break three things um i want a short break so you can stand up and move a little bit restrooms are out there up the up the stairs way down the hall down the stairs up again i'm kidding they're up there you'll find them um if you're interested Casey has a little newsletter sign up. You can sign up for our newsletter. It comes once or twice a week to remind you not to freak out on your kids. If you want additional help and if you really want this stuff to sink in, I encourage you to see Casey. We have audio CDs, but most of you don't have CD players in the car, so we, you get them as this, but you get them as downloads also to multiple devices to share with teachers, uh, husband, spouse, friends, whoever. I don't care. I just want you to listen. I want your kids to listen to these, by the way. Here's your trick. Tell your strong-willed child, hey, parenting secrets to get you to behave, you don't get to listen. And immediately your strong-willed child will download these to his iPhone and he'll listen. But here's your warning. They're going to hold you accountable and say, mom, you're not doing it the way calm guy said. You'd be like, seriously? You're only six. Here's what we put together. This is on stopping power struggles with a strong-willed child. Everything I know about strong-willed kids for the past 20 years. I want your kids to listen to this one because I guarantee they're going to say, he's describing me. That's what it feels like, mom or dad. One little part of this I encourage you to do tonight with your kids, especially older ones, is to ask them, whether by text or in person, does it ever feel like we misjudge your motives? Huge trigger for strong-willed kids, and that will begin to open up their hearts. Discipline that works, I'll do some after the break. Getting kids to listen the first time without yelling or screaming. I'll do a couple examples. Uh, teaching impulse control. We go through about 35 different behaviors. By the way, good discipline should lead to greater trust with you, okay? Because a lot of husbands are like, well, I discipline, but you don't have a relationship with a child. And that's not good discipline. Stop defines disrespect and meltdowns, emotional power struggles. And I'll do some of this after the break too, of how do you calm that child down in the moment? Straight talk for kids is the most popular one. This is one my son did. This is based on his school assemblies that he does. He teaches kids these principles. If you learn how to control yourself, your parents won't have to. And he teaches kids, because he was a really horrible child, how he, no, he teaches them how to control their emotions and, and, and impulses. And they listen because it's a kid talking to a kid, not a stupid parent. Straight talk for stressed out Northern Virginia moms. Self-explanatory. <laughs> Tried to make this like 10 therapy sessions in one. How to get control of your inner life. We just did one for dads for two reasons. Our dads didn't teach us this, and men don't listen to their wives. But if we read something on the internet or a stranger tells us, <laughs> then it's true, and we believe it. <laughs> this is my son and I talking to men like men. We don't talk about our emotions. We just say, guys, here's exactly what you do when you walk in the home at the, at, at the end of the day. Um, uh, there's one on motivating kids. There's one for kids ages two to seven. So everything that toddlers and little kids struggle with. And then final one is called ADHD University. Um, your kids don't have to have ADHD, but if they struggle with everything on that chart, focus and attention, social skills, organization, we go through that in great detail. About 50 different strategies just for homework and school alone. Share it with teachers. There's one on sibling fights as well. So here's the deal with the CDs. If you look on, it, uh, on our website, these are typically $97 or $197 each. 
for the skeptical men, a few of you in here and your husbands, these only cost me $1.22 to produce. I make them expensive for two reasons. One is self-respect. I put a lot of time into this. It will change your family, and I want you to respect that. Second reason related to that is I want ownership and investment. In the early days when we lived here, I sold everything really cheaply. I was like, I'm going to save the world, and nobody listened. When I raised the prices, I got testimonials because guys said, we paid some money for that. Maybe we should work at it, right? And there's something to that. I do. I want people, for me, when people get these, it's drawing a line in the sand saying, we've been doing it that other way for so long. We're going to do it differently. So here's the uh, deal that we're doing. Every day we do a little bit different pricing depending where we are. We're big fans of the Parent Resource Center, and we used to live in this area. In New Jersey, we charge them full price, but here, a little bit different. So... The other night, there's a lady, and she's like, I'm from Jersey. And I'm like, well, you can pay the New Jersey price tonight then, right? <laughs> Just for being difficult. So your handout, the handout says get any two sets for $197. We're doing any two for $97. The big change is it says get any five for $497. We're doing any five for $197. So you can cross out the four and make it a one. The other big change is at the very bottom of the handout says get everything we own, which is all of these plus the sibling fights, plus there's a marriage mentoring program that I did because most men won't go to marriage therapy because they feel teamed up on and it feels stupid and it's really hard work. I did it so you could do it from home and he can even listen by himself. So we're doing everything there for $247. Um, if you look on the website, I think it's $597 right now. Here's the thing. Um, for me, it's 200, 300 bucks is a lot of money. I know it's an investment. For me, it's two or three trips to the therapist's office, but you get about 30 hours worth of practical strategies. If you need, final thing, if you need help financially, ask for it. That's part of what you'll learn on the, the mom CD is being assertive. You've described my home and my family. I need some help financially. Ask Casey, he'll help you. We respect that. We help everybody. I don't need your money from these. I get paid fees everywhere, but I want people to have a little investment. Does that make sense? So if you need that, get help with Casey, I'd like you to take, um, a few, we're really good on time. Um, I'd like you to take, if you want, uh, maybe like a four or five minute break, just to move a little bit. When we come back, I'm going to do um, tough discipline, anxiety issues, motivation, and then we'll do a little Q&A at the end, okay? So move a little bit. If you have questions for me, um, you can come on up and um, talk to me. Hi, how hey, you? how are you? So. Um, let me do, um, are you cold? A little bit? Okay, because I am steaming. So, too bad a lady. Should have thought ahead of time to bring a sweater. So let's do, uh, I did the relentless arguer before. Um, let me do um, a couple quick discipline things. You know, I hesitate to do these things because I don't really believe in them. I mean, I do, but I don't. With discipline, I want you giving your kids lots of tools to succeed. I'll just go through a couple discipline tools that I do like, uh, but I don't expect that they're going to work long term, but you have to do it anyway. Does that make sense? So look, um, two sons, tonight you get 27 minutes to play your video games. No longer up to me to tell you what time, tell you when your time's up. Because I'm tired of that whole one minute left, 30 seconds, turn off your games. Hold on, we need to save it. We need to get to the next level. Uh, uh, right? So, Mike, you've got your own, you've got your own iPhone because I gave it to you when you're too young because I didn't have the courage to wait and I gave in the peer pressure, right? Right? Can I do a quick thing on screens? It's gonna be quick. Here's what I've come to. It's gonna sound jerky. I believe that you already know the right thing to do with screens but you just need the courage to actually do it. True? You need the courage to do it. You already know the right thing to do. I don't have a one, I have kids who you give them an iPhone and you teach them self-control and they can do it and they're fine. And I have other kids and that thing is destroying their life and they become another person that cause unending fights. And, and I understand the pressure, but if you step back, it's like giving your kids like a little bit of cocaine at the end of the day and saying, just do a little bit of blow because it'll take the pressure off, right? And it'll help you relax. You know what I mean? But, and, and so we have this device in their hands that is literally changing who they are because they have a bad attitude. And we're like, but if I take it away, then they're going to be really upset, which is probably a sign that you need to do it. But when I do it, two things. One is I would apologize. Like, I'm sorry, look, I, I made a mistake. I gave you access to this 
way too early and you weren't, you're not able to handle it. It changes who you are as a person. Your attitude has changed. How you treat me has changed. We fight over it all the time. Every night, can I have it back? Nope. Can I have it back? Nope. Can I have it? When can I have it back? <laughs> so I'm going to take it away. My expectation is you're going to be really angry at me. And you should be angry at me because I created a false expectation in giving this to you. And I'm okay you being angry. But what I want you to know is I'll always do what is best for you, even if it makes me uncomfortable. Does that make sense? I'm not advocating that. I'm just saying if, if you need to, that would be a helpful thing. But don't go and say, you know what, you can't control. Because I gave them an addictive thing and then expected, a th and I know parents are always, well, but I want to teach him how to, how to handle it. Well, it's pretty clear that he can't. I can barely control. How many of you get to a red light? What do you do? <laughs> right? And it's awful. And so we can't even do it. Now I expect a nine-year, 14-year-old to do it. So anyway, uh, so I don't mind doing that. When Casey, when he was younger, and we had a little bit easier because everything wasn't as prevalent because he's a little bit older. But the first thing I taught him was, you are not obligated to respond to anyone when they text you or message you. It is an invasion of your time and your privacy because that's how I see it. I will give all of you my phone number. I'm not answering the call because I don't answer phone calls. I let it go to voicemail and then I choose because that's my time. And there's a certain principle there. So when he was young and he first got his stuff, he'd get a text and I'd say, why don't you wait until tomorrow and reply? I know, but they're going to be upset at me. So you own your time. He is, to my annoyance, very good at controlling his stuff. Like he'll go away for the weekend because he works for me. And my brother used to work for me and he didn't have a life. So he would work all the time. So on the weekends, he went to a wedding a couple weeks ago. We had uh, people emailing and like, hey, we want to order this. We want to do this. And I'm like, that's revenue, man. You got to respond. He's like, dad, I'm at a wedding. And I was like, I don't care where you are. Respond to them. But he doesn't even take his phone places. I, I'm not bragging about him because he was a horrible child, but that is one thing he did well. <laughs> no, but I want you to instill, like, teach some of those principles. But here's the larger thing, and I'm not going to do the whole thing on this. If, and remember we talked about whenever you take away something inappropriate, you have to give them something appropriate. So you've got to figure out why are they... Why are they into their screens? And so what I discovered with Casey is I walked into his room, this is way back, he's playing Call of Duty 2, and I sat down next to him and I said, Casey, I'm curious, what about this activity? What about, why do you love this? And it was really interesting if you listen to them without countering them. He said, it's stimulating. It, 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 it's a challenge. I'm a sniper, so I get to be sneaky. And he was good at that. And if you go through, you'll hear these kids you know, video games for your kids, it's, it's our version. And back in the day, we hung out at the 7-Eleven. Your kids don't get to do that stuff. They hang out with each other online. So there's a huge social component to it. Here's the two that we miss with screens with our kids. Competence and confidence. Some of your kids aren't very good at school, but they're really good at playing their video games. Confidence comes from being good at something. So think about this. The reason they're playing their video games on screens is it's meeting all these needs. It's complete control. They're in control. It's stimulating for their brain. It's a challenge. They meet other kids that way. They, they express that they're really good and they get confidence and competence and we come along. Don't do that anymore. So what I want to do is find things like that, giving them a job to do, doing something they're good at. I guarantee some of your kids, if they got a job in the neighborhood and they start making some money because cash is a really nice thing to have in your hand, and you know what's even better is other adults in your neighborhood saying, you're really good at that. When are you coming back? I could use you to do that. That becomes addictive, right, doing that in a good way. Now what do they not have time for as much? They're stupid video games because you filled it with something better. Does that make sense? Yeah. It's not overnight, but that's long term. They'll give up their, look, I don't believe that kids love their screens. I believe it's a fallback that in the absence of knowing something real and genuine that most of us knew as kids, because you and I were outside all the time, we literally just played all day long. So it wasn't hard for us. I remember when we got cable, remember that little cable used to come on your living room and there's first year uh, summer Caddyshack was out. We watched Caddyshack like 140 times, but for the most part, we weren't addicted to TV because we knew that playing out with our friends was more. They don't know that. So you have to take them outside sometimes and get them. You know, I was up in uh, Baltimore. I was visiting my mom and my brother. My brother has, uh, his son is seven, 
and he's on the spectrum. He's a little aspy guy, awesome kid. So I go out there and I'm playing football with him. You know what started happening? Kids start coming out of their house. You know, it's weird. You, and this isn't meant to be sexist, but you get a, a dad out in the neighborhood playing with kids, you will draw people out there. There's something about it. We had seven kids out there all of a sudden. And because, why? Because it's so unusual to have an adult out there. And they weren't my kids, so I was patient with them, and I didn't care that they sucked at football, <laughs> right? So it makes you, but there's something about, you have to lead them outside. You can't go outside and play. They're like, how do we play, right? They don't know it, right? And we laugh at them, but it's kind of our issue because we haven't gone to freak your kids out on Saturday morning. Get up with your spouse and go outside and start doing something like egging neighbors' houses, playing ding dong ditch or something like that. Kidding, but go outside and play and they're gonna be like, what are you guys doing? Oh, we're having fun outside. You guys stay inside and play your video games and be miserable and fight. We're gonna be outside playing and you will lead them out. Anyway, I'm gonna leave it at that. Um, let me do, I'm gonna skip that example. Um, let me do a quick one I've kind of mentioned on motivating kids internally. Three-step process. Uh, number one, identify your kids' natural gifts, talents, and passions. What are they good at doing? What do they love doing? If you want to build confidence, it doesn't come from fixing weaknesses. It comes from giving them an opportunity to give your kids an opportunity to use their gifts, talents, and passions. Number three, accountable to another adult. Let me give you a quick example of how to put this together. The other night, we were somewhere in the area talking, and um, uh, mom sitting up here, 11 year old daughter, and the whole time she was like, oh, this is my child, it's my child, it's all negative, negative, negative. So during the break, I asked her a couple questions. What does your daughter love doing? And her response, she couldn't think. Uh, laying on the sofa, mouthing off, not doing anything. I was like, no, 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 what is she into? What does she love? She loves soccer. Good, I can work with that. Okay, who does she connect well with? Because uh, all of your kids will either get along well with little kids, okay, not siblings, but little kids, animals, or seniors, right? So she's like little kids. So I was like, I've got an idea for you. Go find a soccer coach who's coaching little kids and say, hey, I've got this daughter, she's 11, she's really good for other people, loves soccer, really good with little kids. Could she volunteer and help you out? And so here's what I guarantee will happen in this. You may have to ask a few people, but if that coach comes and says, hey, I've heard you're good at soccer, good with little kids, I need some help because I've got all these little kids, I'm overwhelmed, they don't even know what they're doing, they kick each other, not the ball, right? They run around a little group, could you come and help me out? I guarantee that little girl, that 11-year-old girl, who again is one of our kids who doesn't feel good about herself, everything's negative, she doesn't do well in school, she's got a bad attitude, which makes sense. She's there at that practice and I guarantee this is what's gonna happen. Those little kids are gonna love her. One, because she just has a natural gift with them and she's older, which means she's cool. And she's gonna get hugs at the end of practice from the little girls, because little girls love to hug everybody. And she's gonna feel good about herself. And that coach is gonna say, you're a good helper. Saturday morning, we've got a game would you mind coming out and helping? Because you can start being my assistant coach. Now, look, and you start building on this. You think a little bit of that attitude is going to go away, the bad attitude? Yeah. Why? Because other people see that there's something good. Look, one of my favorite things to do with kids who struggle, not with like deep depression, where, but, but with mild forms of that is, I get them serving other people. When I give out to another person, when, I go, when you go and visit a homeless shelter or visit some seniors, shut in some seniors at a retirement home, take them some cookies on a Friday night and sit and talk to them, you do that with your daughters or your sons, I guarantee it will change some things. Because those older people, they will say, will you, please, will you come back Friday night? We love hearing. And older people will listen forever because they have nothing else to do, <laughs> right? But they do, right? They, they will and they'll listen because they, because they recall, don't you love the energy? Not that you're old, but you are. But, but, but no, but you love the energy and you miss it. My mom lo misses the sound of four boys in her home making noise. And so, and you would affirm, yes, and you have the time and you, see, I use uh, seniors for homework time. Take them to, you would, I guarantee, look, if any of your kids get her dress, she would love, <laughs> no, but seriously, I'm not being funny. Some of you have kids, go down to your house. You would love on those kids. You'd be super patient doing the homework with them and they would want to please you and you could bake with them and do kind of things and then you'd have them do yard work and some things maybe that you don't want to or can't do. And it's this beautiful thing that happens. And with that 11 year old girl, the key to her doing her schoolwork doesn't lie in anything to do with school. But now I start feeling, and guess what those people are going to say? Honey, you're great with kids. Ever thought about being a teacher? Maybe you could be a child psychologist. Maybe you could do this. Maybe you could be a coach one day. 
And now all of a sudden she gets a vision for her life and she has a reason to do well in school, not because mom and dad says it's important that I study and have, they're just gonna reject whatever you want. If you wanna write down a phrase, you have to stop caring about what you care about and figure out what they care about. Does that make sense? Um, I'm gonna do this example. I'm gonna go off my, what I was gonna do. Uh, Cause this is important for you. And I hope you can embrace this. So we're in um, uh, Dallas, Texas working with these parents and these parents are like, all my son ever talks about are elevators. Elevators, 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 right? But here's the problem. You don't get grades for caring about elevators. <laughs> And I said, here's the cool thing. Here's a great way to get them to do homework. Hey, son, listen, the Hilton down the street has 32 floors, has three elevators. If you get your homework done in the next 45 minutes, we'll have time to go down to the Hilton. I'll let you drive the ride up in the elevator for 45 minutes. Or better yet, why don't you go get your backpack? I'm going to go sit you in the elevator. I'll be at the hotel bar. Two hours later, I'll come back. You'll have, kidding. But I guarantee you, this is what would happen. You sit that kid in an elevator, and I guarantee he'll do his homework there, and he will find a couple people who are like, hey, weird little kid, what are you doing? <laughs> right? And he'll own it. He'll be like, still my homework, but I love elevators. And I guarantee some person who's got time, somebody's going to sit on the floor with him and show him how to do his math, and then who's going to come along? The elevator repair guy. And that guy's going to, like, stop the elevator, let him see in between how it works. And here's my point. You have to feed your kids interests and passions. Oh, I'll give you a quick one. I get this email the other day. Uh, great, par good parents, fully engaged with their kids. Six-year-old son, here's what he does. He's good in math, but he goes to the library and gets books out on ancient cultures. He's curious, loves to learn. And I'm like, I want to adopt your son. <laughs> Sounds awesome to me. But then you read, but, you know, in certain subjects or in sports, he won't push through. By the way, none of your kids are going to push through in sports. Just give up on that. Tell your husband. They're not. I oh, know, but he's capable more. He's really good if he would just practice harder. I just know your kids aren't going to practice harder. They're not. They're not even going to do it with music, too. So don't buy expensive mu uh, instruments and pay for some German or Russian lady to teach them piano because they're not going to practice. <laughs> they're not. And you're going to get frustrated if you don't practice. We were in Arlington. This is a great story, and I'll come back to the other one, but this demonstrates it, and I want to hit on this for some reason. Parents came up and said, but our daughter, she won't practice her music. And I said, well, what does she like doing? Well, she plays and she's composing her own music. And I was like, what the f are you talking about? She's composing her own music. That's practicing. She just doesn't want to do what the mean old Russian lady wants her to do. Or, does that make sense? And we get so blinded. So same thing. The teacher, this is a kid in first grade who's reading above grade level, which means he's probably bored in class. And you need to challenge your kids. By the way, getting to do chores, make it harder. Challenge them. Make do uh, chores blindfolded. But you can't do your chores in this amount of time with your shoes on the wrong foot. There's a greater chance you're going to fall down and crack your head open. Your kids are going to love that because you're the, all three in that uh, handout. But look, they were like, the teacher was like, you know, Max, his name is Max. Max is really capable if he would just push himself. I'm like, inside, I was like, you better not effing do this to this kid. You've got a first grade kid. He's interested in books about ancient cultures. And yet we push that aside. I want him to push him. He's in first freaking grade. I'd be celebrating. And I want to go to the teacher and say, watch, this is really good. Talk to the teachers and respect them because they have a hard job. Look, you've got two kids and you can't even get them to listen to you. They've got 20. I mean, you want to teach 20 kids addicted to Fortnite? <laughs> right? I don't. It's really hard. So I'm going to go in and talk to the teacher and say, Mrs. Teacher, Mr. Teacher, I respect you and I love the fact that you want my child to learn. And so you give, and this is mainly for younger kids, but older kids too is fine. You give my child homework because you want them to learn. And I like that about you and I, and I appreciate that. What I want you to know is a couple things. Some nights we're not doing homework because my son's really into ancient cultures and he reads books and we're going to watch documentaries and I want to feed that passion because you know what we both want? We want our son to be curious and love to learn. Sometimes the homework that's given, it's not your fault because the school board decides that and they're not that bright, isn't interesting to a six-year-old boy. 
So some nights we're not doing the homework. And I watch this part I really like. I want to release you from thinking. Now this is important because teachers are very conscientious. Well, I need to give homework because I want to release you from thinking that you have to give homework to my son. And you can give it to him if that's what you have to do. And if you need to mark his grade down because we didn't do the homework, that's okay. Because grades are arbitrary and I don't care about grades. What I want for my son is for him to love learning and to be curious. And so that's what I want. And I'm the parent, so I can do, so if you want to mark the grade down, it's okay. Do what? That's not gonna happen here. As parent, you want to force. I don't give a rip what other parents, it's your home. I know. Right? You have to have the courage to be different, right? And let all the other parents ruin their child's childhood, right? <laughs> Seriously, we're, we're not, I want a kid who's, I'm not, ugh, it's frustrating. And, and, but I want to release the teacher and say, it's not disrespect. It's just, I want my child to have a child. By the way, if I have a six or seven year old, I'm not doing homework at all. That's just plain dumb. It, there's no research that shows that, by the way, there's no research that shows that homework of any age is actually helpful. Now I want your kids to learn how to do, I get that, balance this. But you have every right to say, my six year old, is supposed to be playing outside at night. And so we didn't do homework tonight, send a note in, didn't do homework because last night, you know what we did as a family? We played board games, whole night. We had an awesome time. Guess what all the other families did? They fought over homework and they're miserable. I guarantee you at the end, when your child's older, you're not gonna think back and say, man, I wish we would have fought over homework a little bit more, <laughs> right? I wanna teach your kids how to learn Teach them how to learn. I'd rather you spend the time, instead of doing arbitrary things, saying, okay, let's embrace homework time. How do you want to do it differently? Notice how they work best. You're gonna, some of them, you're going to have to jumpstart their brains by getting a success early on and listening to some intense music and saying, boom, here's a great one. This is a great insight, and we'll end with this. For kids that are kind of have brains like this, it's not about managing their time. It's about managing their energy. Some of you have brains like my wife. She can sit down and work from eight to five. Boom, 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 even, even, even. I work on momentum. I will do um, on Sunday afternoons for whatever reason. I've always worked best since the time I was in college. I work best on Saturdays and Sundays and holidays. When everybody else is relaxed, I work. When everybody else is working, I love, because I own my own business like tomorrow, I'm gonna be out in the middle of the day while everybody else is working and I love it. Because everybody else is working and I'm playing because I feed off of energy. Does that make sense? My son knows, Casey uh, lives in Minnesota. Well, he's moving now, but he will say, Dad, I'm getting up. He does his hardest work, some of his thinking work, in the morning when he's fresh. When he starts fading, he goes to the gym and works out. Working out, really important for your kids. Intense physical exercise brings blood flow to the brain, actually helps him concentrate. It's really, really helpful. Even going through that little uh, uh, obstacle course thing. He manages his energy certain days, you know certain days where you just don't have it? He does paperwork stuff and follow-up stuff. So teach your kids, they know their natural rhythm. Some of your kids will do better like, and I know this isn't the right way, let me do three days of math homework right now. And they'll pound it out. There's nothing wrong with that. That's how they're going to work. Rather than, okay, we're going to do 30 minutes of that, 30 minutes of that, 30 minutes. That shifting between stuff is really hard. I tend to work on my momentum and energy, and I pound one thing out, and then I do another thing. Spend some time over the next few weeks figuring that out. Observe your kids experiment doing homework in the basement outside at a Panera bread shop. Right? A confined, uh, uh, spaces confined time limit. Uh, when Casey was in school and he used to travel with me, we'd pull into town. Say we had a 7 o'clock workshop at night. Uh, we had to be there at 6.30, which means we pull into the Panera at, say, 5.47. And I'd say, Case, we've got to leave here at 6.23. And he knew he had 36 minutes. And he would say, I'm going to try to pound out two essays in the next 36 minutes. Compressing that time for him actually helped stimulate his brain. So play with that and do it differently. I hope for all of your kids, um, I hope they all have a nasty meltdown this afternoon so you can practice this while it's fresh, <laughs> right? But remember, I'll tie it up. Remember to control yourself. Work on your body pot, your tone of voice with it. 
Work on controlling yourselves. It's a really cool thing. Teach your kids how their brains work. Um, thank you again to Valerie. Thank you to the, our cameramen, the, uh, uh, the Parent Resource Center, which does awesome work. Take advantage of their resources. Um, I didn't get to everything, obviously. I will stay afterwards. I'll answer any questions you have. Um, you can email us. It's on our, your handout. We have a Facebook page, Celebrate Calm. If you get the little bag of CDs, I would encourage you, start with the strong-willed child. And if you got the uh, ADHD University one, they're foundational. As you listen, email me. Tell me you met me here. It makes it personal for me. For some reason, I like it, and I will answer your questions and kind of walk you through this. But my final thing I would leave you with, if you want to take a note on it, just put in your brain is, enjoy. I want you to begin enjoying your strong-willed child again, because along the way, you stopped, because they totally effed up your agenda as a parent. True? Because you thought it was going to be a certain way, and we've gotten a little bit resentful, and I want you to enjoy them. Because if you're not enjoying them, and it's always like this, no discipline's going to work. But if I start enjoying that child, can I give you another one? Enter in. The things that irritate you most, embrace them, because I guarantee you those things are going to be what makes them successful in life. And you're going to breathe in heavily like she just did, like, I don't want to enter into it. I want to change it. I guarantee you the sooner you enter in and say, that really irritates me about you, but I'm curious what's really going on inside. I guarantee they will open up their hearts and you will find ways to motivate them because you're understanding them instead of imposing the way I want it done on you. It's really cool when you do that. But anyway, thank you for being awesome parents. You're all good parents. You came to a parenting workshop. All the people who needed this didn't come. And they're the horrible parents. But anyway, we are, um, we're back here tonight at 6.30, from 6.30 to 8.30. So if you have a spouse, uh, I'll do basically the same. Some things will be a little bit different, but uh, please feel free to email people, send them out. I think we still have a little bit of room to do, and otherwise people can sit on the floor. We're good. Anyway. So anyway, thank you. Have a great day, and um, we'll talk to you soon. Yes. Can I ask a question?